This is the second session in the CCS Philosophy of Christian Education program. We will be looking today at the standard of Christian education. So as we begin, let's look at this triangle. We'll call this the Triangle of Necessary and Sufficient Conditions because it kind of provides a framework for what we're going to be doing over the next several sessions. We mentioned last time when we were talking about ethics that one particular important part of ethics is the motive. That is, what is the heart attitude when somebody is acting? Are they acting out of the right motive? Or do they have the right attitude as they act? Another important part of ethics of Christian living is the goal. What are the results of what we're trying to achieve? What are the results of our actions? And then we saw that we also have to live according to a certain standard. What is right and wrong? What's defined as right and wrong? Now what we need to see is that these three aspects, motive, goal, and standard, are all related to one another. And in a way, they're all perspectives on one another. For example, we can think about our motive. If our motive is to love God, uh, we're, we know that that should be the ultimate motive that we have, that we should love God. Well, that implies a particular standard that implies obedience. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. The motive leads to a standard. We're not truly loving God if we're not obeying God. The motive implies the standard. But likewise, a motive implies particular goals. If we love God, we should desire to see his kingdom advanced. It would be pretty strange to say that we love God, but we don't desire to glorify him or to have his kingdom advanced. So a heart attitude, a motive, is going to have a particular outcome as well. A motive implies the goal. Likewise, the goal implies the standard. If you are seeking for the goal of glorifying God and advancing his kingdom, if that's your goal, then how are you going to do that? How can you best glorify God? Well, you glorify God by obeying him. You certainly don't glorify God by disobeying him. So the goal implies the standard. But likewise, we can look at things the other direction. A standard, if we think about commands of scripture, do this and don't do this as a standard. Well, remember that one of the commands of Scripture is to love God and to love our neighbor. So if we are truly following the law of God, if we're truly following the commands found in Scripture, we are going to love God. Commands and love are not opposed to one another. In fact, love is one of the commands of the law. Likewise, if we are seeking for the kingdom of God, if we're looking for a particular goal, we are also going to have a particular motive. How can we best glorify God? We can best glorify God by loving him. We're certainly not going to glorify him by hating him. So our goal implies the motive. And then our standard, if we are following God's law, if we're obeying his law, one of his commands is do all to the glory of God. Another command is seek first the kingdom of God. These goals are in the form of commands or standards. And so what we see is that the motive and the goal and the standard all imply one another. There's a sense in which we have to have each of these. As we said last time, you cannot have proper Christian living if you're ignoring your motives or your goals or the standards. But there's another sense in which each of these is sufficient. If you're truly following all of God's commands, you're going to have the right motive. You're going to be going for the right goals and the other way around. So that's why we call this the triangle of necessary and sufficient conditions. Now this is going to provide a perspective on the next several sessions, like I say, because we're going to be looking at education in these three terms as well. So in this session we're going to be focusing on the standard of Christian education. That is, what does the Bible say is right and wrong as far as the standard or how we are to educate children.
And the primary standard that we see is here in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So let's see how the Bible, how scripture is our standard using this verse. It says that the word of God is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. That is, it's profitable for teaching. It tells us what is right and wrong. It teaches us. That's what doctrine just means. It's teaching. So scripture teaches us God's will. It teaches us how we should live. The second, Paul says that scripture is profitable for reproof. This is how the word of God comes to us and tells us that we have done wrong. Not only does it tell us what we should be doing, but it says you've sinned in this area or that area. It points out our sin to us. This has always been seen as one of the uses of the law of God in general. The, law, the use of the law is revealing our sin to us. And so there's a third use or third uh, way that God has inspired scripture and it's profitable for correction. That is, now that it's shown us our sin, Scripture tells us how we can get back on the right path. It tells us how we can turn our life around. And then Scripture is profitable for instruction in righteousness. That is, it tells us how we can continue living a life that's faithful to God. And what we need to see here is that uh, a helpful analogy for these four things. Uh, one analogy that I've heard is uh, you're going on a trip. Uh, think about the days before you had GPS in your car, when you had a road map. Okay, you're going on a trip from here to Iowa. And uh, so you have a map that tells you here's the route that you should take. You should get on this interstate and then this interstate and then you take this road and this road and you end up at your destination. Okay, it tells you the route that you should be going. That's comparable to scripture as doctrine. It teaches us what's right. It teaches us the way that we should be going. Okay, but then let's say that between here and Iowa, you're driving along and you come to a sign that says, Welcome to Texas. Well, if you know your geography, you know you're not going to be going through Texas to get between Georgia and Iowa. So that sign, Welcome to Texas, serves as a reproof. It says, you know, you've messed up here. You've done wrong. It shows you, I've taken the wrong road somewhere. That's reproof. It points out how you've done wrong. Okay, then correction would be where you look at your map and you say, okay, if we're in Texas, well, we need to get on this road. We need to take this interstate and that will get us to Iowa. That's the correction. It's how you need to fix things. If you do have a GPS, I mean, you know that you follow those, and if you miss a turn, it will say recalculating, and then it will tell you a different way to get to your original destination. That's the correction. And then finally, the instruction in righteousness on your trip, that's kind of like you say, okay, as long as I follow Interstate 75, and I keep looking for signs that say Interstate 75, I'm going to be fine. So you make sure that you follow that. That's the instruction in righteousness. It's like, okay, be sure every so often you see that I-75 sign. That's the instruction in righteousness. And the Bible tells us here's how to live so that you don't fall into sin, so that you don't go off the path again. So that's a helpful analogy for these four thing, portions of Scripture. Now we need to notice too what Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, that he says this is good for every good work. He says that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So scripture applies to everything that we do. Uh, some things it applies very explicitly, some things it's less explicit. But the Bible applies in some way to everything that we do. It equips us for all good works. So that's how we use scripture. Now, one important part or aspect of using scripture is that we need to interpret and apply scripture properly. Now, in our days, when we have Bibles that are on our iPads or iPods or whatever, 
Uh, this doesn't, this isn't as easy to do as it used to be, but you remember there used to be the idea that if you wanted to know God's will, you would just kind of take your Bible and flip it open at random and point to a verse at random and see what God was telling you. That's the wrong way to use the Bible, but you can't do that with iPads anyway. I don't know that there's a random verse app. There probably is, but there's a random verse app. But that's not how we want to be using the Bible in Christian education. We need to follow, first of all, a grammatical historical method of interpretation. Now, we don't have time here to go into a complete course of hermeneutics. But applying the scripture as a grammatical historical method, that is, you look at what the words of scripture are actually saying, the grammatical part. What is the author saying? Let's look at his grammar. Let's look at the words and see what they actually mean. And you do it in a historical context. You think, what did the writer mean in his day? How would the people he wrote to have understood this? Um, there are some uh, writers in the past decades, several decades, who have tried to interpret the book of Revelation in particular, or the book of Zechariah, by saying that they read it and they see God talking about things like Cobra helicopters and atomic bombs. Well, Zechariah or the Apostle John would not have known anything about Apache helicopters or Cobra helicopters, or atomic bombs, or any other modern weapons. That's not a grammatical historical method of interpretation when you're reading those things into it. You need to say, what did John mean by what he said? So you need to follow that. Second, we follow what's called the analogy of Scripture. This is, you interpret Scripture by Scripture. Uh, you take one verse and you see how does it fit into the whole context of the Bible? How does it relate to other verses? You don't just pull something out of context and take it by itself. This is actually what many of the cults do. They take verses in isolation rather than seeing the entire scripture. And then finally, you need to interpret scripture with the centrality of Christ in mind. See, Jesus on the road to Emmaus told his disciples, after his resurrection, he says that he started with Moses and the prophets and went through the whole Old Testament and showed them all the things that referred to him. Christ is the center of the Bible, and we should interpret all of the Bible to see how it points us to Christ. So, Like I say, we don't have time to go through a whole course of hermeneutics, but this will help us as we begin applying scripture to education. So now, let's think about these three aspects of education. I tend to like triads. Uh, if you read John Frame very much, you'll know where that comes from. But uh, three aspects of education where we can apply scripture. Uh, there's the area of discipline, there's the area of teaching methods, and the area of the curriculum. And these three imply one another, they relate to one another. So we're going to see how the Bible applies to each of these three areas. So let's start with scripture and the curriculum. How does the Bible apply to the curriculum? Well, it affects what subjects we study. We look at the Bible and we see what does the Bible say is important. And so let's study those things. How do we know what subjects students should study? We also need to see how we relate to this world. See, our world, our culture has certain understandings and certain expectations of students. And so we want to take the Bible and apply it to those things that will equip our students for the world. We have, they, they're going to need to function in the world. Um, so we want them to be equipped for the world. But this means then, for example, that just because the Bible doesn't talk about computers, we don't then conclude well, we don't need to teach about computers in the school because the Bible doesn't talk about computers. Well, we need to apply the Bible to our culture. So we think about what subjects we study. The Bible also helps us to see what is truth in those subjects so that we know what is true in history or science or whatever other subject we might study. So now let's think through the broad subject areas of the school. Uh, we're going to be studying the Bible. Obviously, if uh, the Bible is the Word of God, we should be studying that in Scripture. Now, there are Christian schools that say that they don't have a course in Bible specifically because they integrate the Bible so thoroughly in their other courses they don't need to study the Bible specifically. I disagree with this. I think that uh, 
yes, you should have the Bible integrated in your other courses, but because the Bible is the Word of God, it should be studied directly as well. And it should be studied the whole time students are here, not just as one course in high school, for example. But they should have Bible study every year they're in school. Language, think reading, language arts, grammar, writing, uh, that whole complex of language arts. We study this because, for one thing, we want our students to know to, how to read the Word of God. This was historically why reading was taught, was so they could read the Bible. And more broadly speaking, the Bible shows us the importance of language. You think about uh, the second verse of Genesis. It says, and God said, speech is right at the beginning of the Bible. It is how God spoke the world into existence. Throughout the Bible we see the importance of language and Adam naming the animals and so on. So language is important for a Christian school. History. It's been said that history is his story. As we study history we're seeing God's actions. It's his work. It's his handiwork. And so we study history to see what God has done uh, the Bible tells us that things that were written beforehand were written for our admonition so that we might learn from the example of those in the past. So this is why we study history. Science. Adam and Eve were given the dominion mandate. They were told to subdue the earth and to rule over the earth. Adam named the animals. This was a form of classification. Science is... Uh, part of our dominion calling, that we are to exercise dominion over all of the creation. Math, from a biblical perspective, is actually a subset of science. Math is just a way that we carry out our dominion mandate in science. Now the thing is that math is so complex and uh, it's more involved, it's foundational. That's why we spend a lot more time on math than we do on science. But in a way, math is there to support science. Technology. We study this because we have to exercise dominion in our society. Our culture is a technologically oriented culture, and so we want our students to know how to use technology effectively. The arts. God created beauty. And the tabernacle and the temple had decorations. They weren't just plain things. They had a lot of decorations that were places of beauty. God himself is described as beautiful. The arts are ways that we can appreciate God himself. Physical education. The body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, we're told. And so taking care of our body, uh, taking care of ourselves, is important biblically. So this is just a brief overview of why we study these different subjects in the Bible. Uh, there are many good books I could recommend for this. Uh, Ruth Haycock has a series of books on uh, biblical subjects and how the Bible applies to various subjects. Also, R.J. Rushdoony has a book on the biblical curriculum, a biblical view of the curriculum. Uh, but there are many other books as well. So now, let's think about how Scripture applies to our teaching methods. Remember, we were thinking about methods, discipline, and the curriculum. Well, we've looked at the curriculum, now let's look at the methods. Scripture governs how we teach. Teaching methods are not neutral. Remember Paul says that the Bible is given to equip us for every good work, and that means the work of teaching. So how do we teach? The Bible tells us this. However, there is not just one right method of teaching. We don't look in the Bible and say, okay, the way to teach is Madeline Hunter's direct instruction, for example or uh, project-based learning is the way that we should teach. There is not one right method of teaching. Remember, methods are ways that we achieve goals. You're looking for particular goals, and so you use different methods to achieve those goals. And varied goals will mean varied methods. If your goal in class, for example, is to um, present a lot of information. If you want the students to have to cover a lot of information quickly, you're probably going to use some form of lecture method. If, on the other hand, your goal is that students are able to uh, mix certain chemicals properly, 
well, you're going to have more of an experiment and project-based and hands-on type method. Different goals are going to mean different methods. So let's think about then the ways that we, uh, some methods that are used to teach in the Bible. Think about how God teaches some different things. One thing, God uses sermons or didactic instructions. I mean, God spoke from the mountain. He talked to the people. Jesus taught from the mountain. Okay? So that there are times when God instructs us just by telling us things. The prophets did this as well. So you have lectures. Uh, that's a proper method of instruction. Another method that God used was stories and parables. I mean, we think about this, Jesus and the parables. You have different stories throughout the Bible. In fact, much of the Bible is in the form of stories that we learn from. Uh, I have a friend who's a missionary in a sense to vary in the Middle East. And he tells, he's been doing a lot of research and study on effectively communicating with people in the Middle East. And he finds that the issue of the method of storytelling is very important for people there that a lot of truth is communicated through stories. As they tell parables, they tell different stories to illustrate some truth. And so uh, this is a way that we can teach as well. You might also, there's the idea of doing something first before you understand it. Think about the Old Testament sacrifices. When God, in the books of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers, gave the sacrificial system, he didn't explain them to the people. He didn't tell them why they needed to sacrifice. He just said, do it. Over time, the people began to understand what the significance of the sacrifices would be. They would understand, for example, that because they have to sacrifice a lamb every day, that a lamb is not a perfect sacrifice. That they should be looking for something that is perfect, that would completely cover their sins. But then it's not until the time of the New Testament that we begin to see, here's what the, uh, here's what the sacrifices really meant. So they did something first and then understand. There are times when this is how we teach our students. We just say, do this. We tell them the algorithm for long division, for example, before they understand why that algorithm works. Uh, just do it, and then you'll understand it later. So there's times when we teach this way. There are times, if you look in the Bible, there's a call-response type pattern. Uh, you look in the Proverbs and the Psalms, for example, in the parallelism, where there's a statement given, and then there's a response in which the statement is rephrased. It's not just reiterated exactly. Uh, God comes to us with his word. He expects us to reply take his word and to apply it and to re rephrase it back to him. We want our students to do this. We don't say that they've truly learned something if all they do is memorize what we say and parrot it back to them. We want them to take the words and then be able to reshape them, to say things in their own words and do things themselves and apply it. That's that call-response type pattern. The Bible also gives, comes to us in the form of Proverbs and riddles. If you look at the beginning of, of Proverbs, in Proverbs 1.6, Solomon says that the purpose of his writing is that his child might understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise are their riddles. It helps us to understand and to figure out riddles. It's not always best just to tell students the answers to things. Sometimes what the best way for them to learn is for us to pose a problem to them and have them figure it out on their own. I mean, you think back to your own learning. There's times when the things that you have had to figure out for yourself, you remember them much better. You've learned them much better rather than somebody just telling you the answer. So at times, the most effective way for your students is to help them figure out the answer, to tell them how to do these things. So these are just some of the teaching methods in Scripture. There are many others, but you think through the various ways that God teaches us. But the point is that there is not just one 
right method. You have a number of methods that you use. Now the third way scripture applies to education is in the area of discipline. And this has been a particular focus here this year with our emphasis on the culture of grace. So we'll be going through things uh, rather quickly here. But the point is that scripture does apply to discipline. And we have to see that there's a positive significance to the idea of discipline. Think about the root word. Discipline and disciple are related. The positive idea of our discipline is that we are discipling our children. A lot of times we tend to think that discipline means punishment. I mean, we use it this way. We'll say, well, that child is disobedient. He needs to be disciplined, meaning we need to punish him in some way, whether it's spanking or something else. Discipline just means being made a disciple and learning how to live in a proper way. And so we're discipling our students. We want to shepherd their heart. And there's, again, this is the focus we've had in the culture of grace. We want to deal with the hearts of the students, not just their outward behavior. And there are three aspects of our discipline that we can look at. Another triad, I realize. We have control, authority, and presence. Control, when we discipline students, is the idea that we are making them do certain things. And this is not bad. I mean, you think about Israel in the wilderness, for example, after the Exodus. Uh, God forced them to keep the Sabbath day by giving them manna six days of the week and none on the seventh. Uh, they had no option but to keep the Sabbath day in this way. Okay, he controlled their behavior. After 40 years of that, they were used to the idea of resting on the Sabbath day. And so there are times when this is the way we discipline our students. We just make them do things. Uh, with young children, you have them walk in a straight line down the hall. Uh, you have different things that you just make them do. Uh, it's not a lot of explanation. You just make them do it. Authority, though, is the idea that you do teach them. You have teaching. God comes with his laws. He comes with the Ten Commandments. He has the authority to tell us what to do. And so part of discipline is going to be this idea of teaching them. You explain things to them. And then the idea of presence is the mentoring aspect. You spend more time with them. This involves rewards and punishments, but also the idea of being with them. Uh, coming alongside them. And so uh, with our students, as students get older, it tends to shift more from the control to the authority to the presence. Like I say, with very young children, there's a lot of just control. You don't spend a lot of time explaining things to them, although you do explain, but it's more a matter of just do this. As they get a bit older, you get into upper elementary grades and so on, there's more an idea of teaching them. Here's why you should do this. And as they get even older, as they're on into high school, there's not a lot of discipline that's done with control. You can't make high school kids do much of anything. Uh, and you do teach them, but there's also the idea that you're disciplining them through your presence, through mentoring them, through being with them. And like I say, none of, it's not a matter that you are exclusively using one or the other, but it's a matter of emphasis. So this helps us to see uh, just these three aspects of discipline. Now, let's talk about scripture and excellence. Uh, how the Bible applies to our concept of excellence. We want to have excellence in our content. You see, we have high expectations for our students. Uh, scripture tells us that we are to glorify God. It tells us that we should strive for perfection. After all, uh, that's the standard God gives for us. He says, be perfect as I am perfect. So there's high expectations, but also we give our students assistance in meeting those expectations. See, we don't just say, okay, here's the high standards. Now you figure out how to do it. You sink or swim. No, we give them assistance, we help them, we do all we can to help them to achieve those high standards. Excellence in methods means what's kind of a buzzword in education today, best practices. 
you look at research, you look at different things and see what is the best way to achieve these goals. What's the most effective ways? Excellence and discipline. Again, like I said, God says, be perfect as I am perfect. So we have high standards of discipline. And so then we disciple the students so they can meet those high standards. Now I'd like for you to think about how you might apply what we've learned today. In the notes section of your course notebook, uh, please jot down some ideas how specifically you think you might be able to apply scripture in your class to one of these areas, to content, methods, or discipline. Give that some thought and jot that down in the notes section of your course notebook. So in our next session then, we'll be talking about scripture and motive.